everybody. Hey, um, there's one thing that's coming up starting next week, too, that, that uh, is in your bulletin, but we didn't talk about. So around this time of year, people like to give, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas, people want to give. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. Sometimes our desire to give doesn't match the need that people have, right? We want to give something, and we give it, and it makes us feel good, but it doesn't really match the need that people have. So what we did is we called the food bank, and we asked them, when do you most need contributions? Because everybody gives around Thanksgiving and Christmas. And they told us September is the month that they need um, donations the most. So we're going to collect them starting next week for the month of September, and then at the end of the week we'll, or the month we'll just donate to them. Because that's what they said they need. And so to give is good, but we want our giving to match the needs of the person that we're giving to. And so um, starting next week, you'll just see a box in the back. It'll say, um, for the food, yes, Wes? I have to give cash too. Okay, yeah, you can give cash too, I guess. Wes said, Wes, we'll be happy to take your cash. <laughs> no, they'll take cash. So, I mean, if you want to give in that way, you can give that way too. Um, so if you, in your, how do they do it, Wes? Just make a note. Okay, make the check out to the Hawaii Food Bank. So you can give financially. But our real point is that we want our giving to match the need. And they said they need in September. So that's why we're going to give them. Okay? Well, let's pray one more time, please. Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning and, and uh, to be participating in this worship service. And you are certainly worthy of our worship. And Father, that continues right now as we look into your word and want to understand what do you want from us, Father? How can we do what you want us to do? So please show that to us this morning, that we may have a better understanding of what it is you're calling us to do. And Father, we thank you that you'll do this, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I like trees. I mean, I like to look at them. Uh, I think they're beautiful, fantastic. I'm one of those that think they should not be allowed to cut down a tree, like one of those big major trees, without permission. There was a tree at the base of uh, the Leaky Leaky one time, a huge banyan, and somebody bought the house and just chopped it down. That was terrible. But, you know, what can you do? I mean, think about it. Trees give us so much, don't they? They give us shade. They give us wood. They give us food. There's shelter for people, animals to live in. And where do they come from? They come from a seed or a nut. That huge tree is contained in that one thing, not like compressed in there. The genetic code that enables a tree to grow is in there. And when this chemical reaction occurs in the ground with water and all this stuff, it begins the process that this little container that holds a tree starts to process. Now, to me, to me, that just screams a creator, doesn't it? Doesn't it look like somebody must have created that? And the other thing, that thing, if you don't want a tree, you can eat it, right? If you're hungry, you can eat it instead. Have a nut, right? I don't know, you like nuts? I like nuts. But, I mean, it's just, to me, that's trippy that God made things that way. Now, we, have a, uh, we had a tree at our house. It was like a some kind of orange tree. I don't know what it was. The fruit wasn't that good. And it had like massive thorns like this. And so we cut that thing down to the ground. And within a few months, it was trying to come back to life again. Things are sprouting up. You know why? Because the roots were still there. The roots were there. A tree's got to have roots. If it doesn't have roots, there's no tree. But you can't have a tree without roots. It doesn't work that way. If you have true, uh, roots, you can have a tree. And we've been looking at what are the roots of our faith? What are the things that we have to have to live our Christian faith? Because we don't need this building. We don't even need to meet on Sunday. We don't need those things. We don't need a sound system. They're good. We want those things. We don't need them to practice our faith. So we've been looking at Acts 2, verse 42, the last couple weeks, and again this morning. And it says this, talking about the beginning of the church. The church had just started. And it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And we looked at fellowship first, that this church is not us meeting together for an hour on Sunday. It's not meant to be that. If it is, then we've turned it into that. That was never God's intention. It was his intention that we would connect in a deeper, more ongoing way than just Sunday. And last week, we looked at the apostles' teaching. We don't have the apostles today, but we do have what they wrote. And there's also people like myself that God has raised up to teach. And the subject hasn't changed. They taught about Jesus, and we still teach about Jesus. He's preeminent. And so this morning, we're going to look at the next one. I want you to think for just a minute. Think about your relationships either that you have had or that you have now. And we have many relationships, many kinds. I remember it was the first time I'd thought about this before, but this guy, he's a comic book writer, but he's super smart. He's talking about something else, but he said that the way we talk, the language we use when we're talking to our parents is different than when we're talking to our friends. I'd never really thought about that before, but you actually use a different way of speaking, a different language to talk to your parents than you do to your friends. And so we have many kinds of relationships. But I want you to think, do you have a relationship, at least one, that you can truly be yourself, that you feel comfortable, you don't have to pretend, you can be who you are. If there's something on your mind, you're comfortable telling that person that you don't have to be afraid that they'll judge you or think less of you, that you can share your innermost thoughts. Is there somebody like that? And... um, I was listening to a message by Pastor Tim Keller today. He said, somebody who can lean on your chest. Is there anybody in your life that could do that? And for him, it was just his wife and his sons. His friends were not allowed to lean on his chest and mine either. But we're talking metaphorically. So do you have a relationship like that? And hopefully you do. It's healthy to do that. We all need them, but they're rare. But hopefully we have them. Now, I want you to think about this. That relationship, hopefully, that you have of intimacy, where you can be yourself, was it based on primarily your interactions with them, you asking for stuff? That that level of intimacy came about because you primarily went to them to ask them for something. Or you only went to them in times of trouble. The only time you interacted or went to them or talked to them was when you were in trouble. Was it those two things that led you to get to this type of relationship? Because I think for most of us, that describes our relationship with God. And when I asked you that question about do you have intimacy with anybody, did Jesus come to your mind? Was that the name or the person that you thought of? I have that intimacy with Jesus. Did his name come to mind? And if it didn't, why not? Because we're Christians that is meant to be the most intimate relationship we have. And, and I think for many of us, that's not the case. So why is that? Um, well, one, how do we get that? How do you get that intimacy with Jesus? And it's through prayer. It, it, that's how we get it. Primarily, it's through prayer, through interacting and talking with God. Now, why don't we pray more? Well, one... Um, We're not devoted to it. It says that the apostles were devoted to it. Would you describe yourself or me, myself, as being devoted to the idea of prayer? Devoted to it. I make it my priority. Um, For many of us, I think we have other priorities. Things that we say are more important than prayer, than connecting with God. I think that's one reason we don't pray more. The other thing is, let's, let's be realistic. Prayer is hard. It's not an easy thing. It's not uh, something you slip into easily. It is hard work. Now, for example, let's say your job is hard, and I don't think there's any job that's totally easy. Some are harder than others. Sometimes the job we have is harder than others. Every job has its challenges and its difficulties, and maybe seasons of them. They go up and down. So your job is hard. So to avoid it, you don't go to work. What do you get? You're not going to get paid if you're not going to work, right? You don't get anything, right? And it's the same with prayer. If we say prayer is hard, so I'm not going to do it, what do we get? We get nothing. And we are meant to have intimacy with God. That's what we are made for. We have to pray. Our spiritual health depends 
on us praying. Now, it's okay to pray for ourselves. It's okay, God, can you help me? The Bible says that we can ask for our daily bread. God tells us to ask for these things. It says, God, can you keep us from evil? He tells us it's okay to ask for those things. It's our right to pray for ourselves. And it's easy, quite honestly, to pray for myself. I have no trouble asking for things for me. But if I'm going to mature and grow as a Christian, I'm also going to pray for the things that God wants. If I'm having a relationship with God, then I'm going to also pray for the things God wants. And so for me, as a husband, as a father, uh, I get satisfaction out of my family being taken care of. Right? If I know that they're housed and clothed and fed, I'm at peace. If they're not, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I can't be okay, right? Because I love them, I want their needs to be met too. I pray for the things that they need and they want because I love them, right? I don't just pray for myself. I pray for them too. I pray for you guys, right? Um, because it can't all be about ourselves. It's okay to pray for ourselves, but we've got to pray for more than that. We've got to pray for what God wants too if we're really going to have a relationship with Him. So what does that look like? Well, we're going to look at a story this morning. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to be in Genesis 18. And we're going to read a story about Abraham. Now, Abraham was nobody special. In other words, he was special. He's important to our faith. Um, God called him out from a land. He lived with a bunch of idolaters. They worshipped other gods, and he called them out. He said, come out of there to a land I will show you. He didn't tell him the land it was. He said, I'm going to show you. He said, come out, and I'll make you a blessing to the whole earth. That's what God told him. And it says Abraham was not righteous in himself. It says God counted him as righteous because he believed what God said. That's all it took was to believe. And God says a lot of things to you and I. Do we believe him? Do we have faith in him? Because he'll count us righteous if that's the case. And so all along the way, God is showing Abraham what to do. He told him, you're going to have a son. Never had a son. Um, and he said, through that son, I'll bless the world. So in this particular story, what's happening is Abraham is a rich man. It's the middle of the day. He's sitting in the door of his tent. And he sees these three guys approaching. And so in Middle Eastern hospitality, he addressed their needs. He said, come, sit down. He fed them. He took care of them. And it's God. It says that it's God and a couple angels who look like men. And they mentioned this son again. He said, next year I'm coming back, and you're going to have that son at that time. But that's not the only reason the men are there. They're on a journey. They're going somewhere. They're going to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's where we pick up the story. So in Genesis 18, verse 16, it says, Then the men set out from there, and they looked down the road towards Sodom. And Abraham and went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done together, all together, according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous people within the city. Will you sweep them away? Will you then sweep away, uh, will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to dead with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find Sodom, at Sodom, 50 righteous people in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. 
Abraham answered and said, Behold, I've undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke and said, Suppose there are forty there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let the Lord not be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now in this story, we see the dual nature of God. God is holy and righteous and perfect, and he must address sin. But God is also merciful and gracious, and I'm glad he's both. That guy a year or two ago went into that theater in Colorado when they were showing the Batman movie, and he killed a bunch of people, and he was just on trial. And the sentence was that he will, he'll die in jail, basically. And the parents of those people were satisfied. They felt like justice was done, that the, the lives of their kids and loved ones that were taken, at least justice was done for what happened to them. And don't you feel that way? We may not have experienced something that horrific, but if somebody mistreats you or does something wrong to you, don't you have that hope? They'll be just, either now or someday God says there will be just. I'm glad God's a just God, but I'm also glad God's a merciful God. And it says in the Bible in Psalm 130, God, if you keep record of our sins, who could stand before you? Nobody. I'm glad God is gracious and merciful because otherwise I'd be judged because I'm the one that's mistreated people. I'm the one that's done things wrong. And so we see the dual nature of God in this story. What does this story teach us about prayer? I mean, we, that's why we're here. That's what we're talking about. So as I said, just prior to this, God told Abraham just before the story, hey, I'm coming back next year. You will have a son. You're going to have more children. You're going to bless this world than anybody ever before. And he didn't have one yet. But that's God's promise of dealing with sin, right? God's promise. Because the real um, gift that Abraham would provide was he was the lineage. He was the beginning of the line to Jesus. God's solution to sin. So God, in this story, we have the solution to sin. But we also have sin itself. God is saying, look, Sodom and Gomorrah are so bad, I have to address it. And in an earlier chapter of Genesis, it says it's the men that are the problem. The men of the city are the problem. And there it's sexual deviancy, but it's not just that. They're vicious and violent. If you go on to read the story, these are vicious, violent men. God cannot ignore their behavior. He has to address it. And so he does. That's the righteousness of God. Now Abraham was meant to be a blessing to the world. And he is. What does he do? He's advocating with God on behalf of these people, right? He's talking to God. God, what about these people, right? God is going, he must deal with this city. But Abraham's saying, what about the people who aren't doing this stuff? What about the people who aren't participating? God, are you going to destroy them too? And so the way he blessed was advocating for these people. It's God's job to judge. Jesus is the judge of all the earth. He will judge, not us. But we are to be a blessing to this earth and we can do it through prayer we can pray for people who are in difficult circumstances we can pray for people who are suffering though they don't deserve it we can be a blessing to the world in that way it's not our job to judge but we can bless through prayer just like abraham did and we can do that too we are meant to be a blessing through prayer i was reading a book this uh, week and it said this satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. The weakest saint. I wonder if Satan trembles very much. Are we on our knees? Are we praying for people? We have the power to make a difference. 
Um, I just read, too, this week that, I don't know if you're old enough, you remember the Berlin Wall. So there used to be communist, the communist world, and there was the free world, right? And they were divided by the Berlin Wall. After World War II, Berlin was divided into two parts. It was two cities. There was West Berlin and East Berlin, and it was divided by a wall. And that was symbolic of these two philosophies, communism and, and freedom. And uh, in many ways, Ronald Reagan was responsible. I mean, his plan was to destroy communism by making it bankrupt, driving it bankrupt, which he did. Um, but what people, most people don't know, there was people praying in communist countries, praying for this to happen on a regular basis. Can we dismiss that and say that had nothing to do with it? Or maybe that was the true catalyst to make this happen. How many times is that happening? That people are praying and things are happening, but nobody knows about it. They're not going around announcing. They're not doing it in public. They're doing it in private. I, I um, told you this story before, but there was a group of people who wanted to start a church in Africa, and for a month they prayed together every day to start this church, and then they went out. And they ministered in public, and they were hoping people would come. And nobody came. Nobody responded to their um, evangelism. And so in their mind, because I would think, well, I guess we weren't supposed to do this. I'll find something else to do. But they thought we didn't pray enough. So they prayed for another month before they went out. And they did it again, and they evangelized. And they said the worst guy in the town that they were ministering, the worst guy became a Christian. And um, who knows what could happen? I don't know the story beyond that. I just know the beginning of it. I know. i got to find out, yeah? Maybe next week. Come back next week. I'll try to find out. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, that prayer makes a difference. But we don't see it, right? We may see the effects of it. It's like a root. You don't see roots. You see the effects of it in the tree. But prayer has that same kind of effect. It can make a huge difference. And we are meant to bless people through prayer. Now we see through this conversation the intimacy between God and Abraham. They're having a conversation. We are not meant to talk to God. We're meant to talk with God. And that's what Abraham is doing. They're having a conversation, right? They're speaking with one another. Obviously, they're friends. They know each other. They're familiar with each other. They have a relationship. And friends confide in each other. And God says, hey, I'm about to do this big thing. And he's there with Abraham, right? And he's not just going to go on and not talk to him about it. He tells him, hey, I'm about to do this. I'm headed to this city. Bad things are going to happen. And he talks to Abraham about it because that's his friend, right? They have a conversation. And that's Abraham's opportunity to talk to God on behalf of those people, right? But if they have no friendship, they have no conversations. And prayer is meant to be a conversation that we have with God. Amen? So prayer is meant to be a conversation. We also see in this story that Abraham has great respect for God. Think of how he addresses him. Now, I, I, sometimes in my prayers, I have to catch myself. The way I'm talking to God is not proper. I get all excited about something or upset about something, and I have to say, God, I'm sorry. I, I should not have addressed you in that way. I was wrong. Even though we are friends with God, we have a relationship with God, we are not equal with God. And we have to talk to Him in an appropriate way. And prayer reveals to us who we are in that sense. The perspective should become very clear. God is God. And we're not even close. Now, He says we're our friend. In that sense, there's an equality but we got to remember who God is and address Him in the right way and talk to Him with that kind of respect. And it will show us not just our relationship with God, but to other people. Prayer is going to reveal who we are. Prayer, the more you get into the prayer, uh, to prayer, the more God can show us about ourselves that we could not have seen otherwise. And it's not all good. And it is all good because to know the bad stuff is good. But just know that if we go into prayer, God, we're going to, it's a natural result to see ourselves as we really are. The motivations of our heart, which are wrong. I was at a dinner the other night, and it's actually a, 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 prayers, a pastor's dinner. And there was somebody who I, in the past, we had kind of had some conflict. And I, I hold on to that. I, I don't feel like I, 
I am resentful towards him, but I, I am careful in my relationship with him because of what happened in the past. I figure, well, I just don't want to get burned again, right? So I'm not going to give him the opportunity. And I felt God convicted me. Very convicted that uh, my attitude was wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And, but I would have held on to that, thinking I was righteous. But God showed me that was wrong. What can I do? I'd rather hold on to it because I feel like I'm in the right. God's telling me I'm wrong. So I've got to let it go. And my job is to reach out and um, i got to expose my other cheek, in other words, right? Not to get abused, but just to forgive and forget and move on. Uh, that's what God is calling us to do. So prayer reveals who we are. And the last thing is this. God listens to what Abraham has to say. Abraham is able to influence what God does. Now, we'd make a mistake to think that, and if you read it carefully, you see it's not that way. It's not as though God is determined to go there and wipe these guys out in, in, a, in a heated rage, and Abraham calms God down and says, hey, God, wait, wait, wait. Are you sure you want to do it? It's not like that at all. God is merciful, way more merciful than us. It's not, it may look like Abraham's more merciful and he convinced God to be merciful. It's not like that at all. God wants to be merciful. He had this in his heart the whole time to do it. The whole objective of this was to interact with Abraham and get Abraham involved in the process. God knew what he was going to do, but he wanted Abraham involved. God wants us involved. Why? I don't know. Because we're so stupid and inefficient. God could do it much better without us. He could. But he wants us involved. We are part of the process. He's not going to abandon that. He is committed to that, that we are part of the process. And we screw it up a lot of the time. But God says, I don't care. I'm sticking with you. This is the way it's going to be. We are going to interact. We are going to do this together. So we have a vital part to play in this. God wants us involved. And so we need to see because of that, because he's given us a role, that it matters if we're involved or not. Abraham was able to move the hand of God. He was able to get God to do something. Not that change God's mind, but prayer was an important part of this process in what God did. And so we have a role to play. Prayer moves God's hand. But we've got to pray in order for that to happen. God makes us part of the process. Now, uh, prayer is difficult. As I said, there may be nothing harder, but you and I have to commit ourselves to it, even if it's a little bit at a time. Carve out, I was just talking to, um, I have a, uh, a mentor I meet with online. And he was telling me about how he does. He said when he wakes up in the morning, he has his iPhone there. In bed, he, he prays the Psalms. So he's got the Psalms on his phone. And I've heard that before. Other pastors do that. He, so right from the beginning, he's turning his mind toward God. And he's, he gets a Psalm on his phone. And he, as he reads through it, he turns it into a prayer. He said he's putting his heart, his intention behind it. And he's praying what that Psalm says. So that's one way to start. But we have to make it a priority. He says they were devoted to prayer. Are you and I devoted to it? Because if you're devoted to something, I'm devoted to my wife. That means no other, there's no other woman. I mean, I'm faithful to her, right? That means devoted. Am I devoted to prayer? That I'm going to let nothing else, right? I want to let another woman come between me and my wife. I won't pursue another woman because I'm devoted to my wife. But I'll let other things come in the way of prayer with God. I'm not devoted to it. But we need to be. We need to be. Amen? Now, in here, in this verse in Acts, it says they're devoted to the prayers. And what that means is the collective prayers of the church, right? That we are meant to pray together as a church. And let me read this last quote. He says, Christians who neglect corporate prayer are like soldiers who leave their frontline comrades in the lurch. So we have to pray when we come together. There's people who need our prayer. And that's what we're going to do right now. So it's hot. I know that saps our energy. But what we're going to do is we're going to get up and we're going to make a big circle here. And we're going to hold hands. And as you're doing that, let me just tell you this. So I had somebody I work with who's not a Christian but knows I'm a pastor. 
her cousin killed himself. Um, he had a lot of health problems. Hey, people in the back, what you think? You're, you're, uh, you're not out of this. Come on. We're going to have to work this out because it's supposed to be a connected circle. Is that possible? Stretch, stretch. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Lady. All right. So um, this lady who I work with, she asked me to pray for her cousin who killed himself. I told her I would. And then she was telling me about her own problems. She has diabetes and she's worried. So I said I would pray for her. I did pray for her. But I guarantee you, you know somebody that needs prayer, right? Maybe it's you. Well, I'll do the praying, but you, we'll all pray together with our intention. Think of the power that's in that. The incredible power. If one guy, Abraham, could move the hand of God, what could we do? I think we sell ourselves short. We have the power to make a difference in our lives, but in the community too, because we pray. Amen? So let's put that to practice right now. Father, we come before you as a group. Yeah, I'm saying the words, Father, but you know we're all in it together. And we show that through our holding of hands. And Father, as a church, we just come before you, Father, on behalf of anybody here who has a need, whether it is physical, they're sick, and my wife is sick, she's homesick, would you bless her? Anybody else who is sick here this morning or has a physical need, Father, we pray a blessing on Together we ask you for that. Father, for um, this food drive that we're going to start, we pray that that food would go in to people truly in need, that they would be blessed, and not just by the food that their stomachs would be full, but that they would thank you for it, Father. They would know it came from you. Father, we give it with that intention as though we're giving for you. And Father, for uh, our community, we are in this community. We are meant to be light and salt and a blessing. And Father, the main way we can bless them is by praying for them. So we pray for this school, Father, for Akahi Elementary. We pray for everything that takes place here. Learning is supposed to take place here. Would you make that happen? True learning would happen in the school. That the teachers who have such difficult jobs that they would be blessed, that their job would become easier, Father, not more burdensome, but that they would lighten their load and allow them to focus on the job of teaching. Bless all the students here, Father, uh, in particular any that, that uh, are part of our church. Bless this school. Bless this community. May the gospel go forth from here and all your other churches to bless this community. And Father, I thank you for these people that we're holding hands together, that we could get to know one another. Father, help each one of us to spend time with you this week, to make it a point, make it a priority, to pray with you, to talk with you, and not just on our own behalf, Father, but for others who are in need. And for all this, Father, we thank and we praise you, and we ask it all in your Son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Oh, and bless the food too, please, Father. Kai, we got some, one more thing to do? Yeah, we got to come back. You guys got to go back. <laughs>